I was as astonished as anyone might be that ivermectin has potential as an anti-cancer agent. I began to be aware there was 20 years of research showing that ivermectin had great potential in the treatment of cancer. In this episode, I sit down with cancer surgeon turned researcher, Dr. Kathleen Ruddy, who has been studying how repurposed drugs like ivermectin may impact cancer survival rates. A guy in his 70s who had been losing weight for a year and a half, 40 pounds, not vaccinated, and um, he could no longer swallow, and he could hardly talk. The patient started taking ivermectin, and within a few weeks, he started to feel a lot better. We got the scan, no tumors, gone, gone. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelly. Dr. Kathleen Ruddy, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. Thank you for having me. You are deeply involved with the FLCCC and working on ivermectin, of all things, Mm -hmm. as a possible treatment for cancer. And this is kind of, you know, might be astonishing to some people, right? I mean, ivermectin, of course, you know, very famous drug for river blindness, probably saved millions of lives. We know it's effective for treating COVID-19 in early stage, especially. Um, there's been a lot of studies done around it, but, but cancer? I mean, is, are you FLCCC people all just obsessed with ivermectin? That's the question, right? I'll have to say that I was as astonished as anyone might be that ivermectin has potential as an anti-cancer agent. I'm a cancer surgeon. We don't do parasites, okay? We don't do ivermectin. Um, and I was not really even familiar with those people who use ivermectin. Um, and so when, in the early days of COVID, when it became clear that ivermectin was effective in preventing and treating patients with a SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, I began to be aware, having looked in the literature, that there was 20 years of research showing that ivermectin had great potential in the treatment of cancer. And I was like, well, I don't understand anything, okay? Why would an anti-parasitic medication be effective against a virus? They're two completely different, not even organisms. They are so far apart from each other on the evolutionary tree that I could not understand why a medication that would be effective in killing a virus and a parasite then show some efficacy in killing cancer cells. So I went back to the beginning. I think whenever you've got a big question, some confusing information, go back to the beginning and see if you can understand the vocabulary and the basic science. And so the basic science begins historically with uh, Satoshi Amura digging in the dirt near a golf course in Japan. Everybody knows that story. It's on Wikipedia. Okay. The question that I asked was, why was he digging in the dirt? Why would you look in the dirt for an antibiotic? It, it didn't make sense to me. So I, I explored that and learned that if you were looking for antibiotics, you would look in the dirt. You would look in sewage. You would dig up you know, the ground. Why? Why? Well, because single cell organisms, um, bacteria, uh, fungi, uh, mold, yeast, they make antibiotics. So antibiotics, anti-life, described decades ago as bioweapons. The researchers who were studying antibiotics refer to them as anti-life bioweapons. Again, the question is, why would a single cell organism, you would think it's got a lot of things it needs to do, why would it synthesize this molecule, ivermectin or mebendazole or whatever? Because single cell organisms do not have an immune system. Multicellular organisms can diversify and they can assign immune defense, defend the organism from attack uh, in a very marvelously intricate way, and they do that. Single cell organisms, it's, they're on their own. And so what they've done, evolved over hundreds of millions of years, to synthesize these molecules 
these bioweapons that they then secrete into the environment that act as sort of the Swiss Army knife. That's the immune system. It's that molecule. So it has to do as many things as possible mm -hmm. in order to preserve the organism mm -hmm. from predators and to give that organism an advantage when competing in the environment for resources. So you're competing with your neighbors, you may be competing with your relatives, right? But really you want not to be eaten or poisoned. Mm -hmm. And so over a period of hundreds of millions of years, we can assume Streptomyces synthesizes ivermectin. And ivermectin goes out there and that's the immune system into the environment around the organism and it can kill parasites and it can dismantle viruses. And because I believe there is substantial information, scientific evidence of tumor viruses, we know that 15 to 20% of cancers are caused by tumor viruses. It is my belief, and I'm not alone in this, that the majority of cancers are caused by tumor viruses yet to be discovered. And so it makes sense to me, once I understood that, it made sense to me why ivermectin would be effective against parasites, and everybody knows that for 50 years, win the Nobel Prize, fine, basically eradicate river blindness almost entirely, and dismantle viruses because viruses that get inside bacteria are called phages, right? And they disrupt the genome. You want to get rid of those guys too. And if in fact there is a close relationship between viruses and cancer, I think there is, then that gets at cancer too. This very wonderful one molecule, three inch thick <laughs> Swiss army knife, that's the immune system. And I think when people understand that, they're better able to um, accept that if this single-celled organism can do this with one molecule, mm -hmm. that perhaps <clears throat> knowing that it's safe and effective against parasites and safe and effective against SARS-CoV-2 and a host of other viruses, and in the laboratory, in vitro, in vivo studies, 20 years of research at least, effective against uh, cancer cells, well, okay. Then the question is, why don't we pose the question, do these medications, ivermectin, mebendazole, the rest of them, do they improve the survival of patients with cancer? You can see it, they kill cancer cells, human cancer cells, in the lab, in animals, fine. Are they effective in improving the survival of patients with cancer? Simple question. And that brings us to the agenda for today. <laughs> it does indeed. It does indeed. Um, I can see you've done a few lectures, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I would say, well, I would have enjoyed, uh, you know, basically learning, learning from you as a, as a resident or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about something that's actually quite important to me. I've been kind of resisting uh, getting a sponsor for the show for some time. There's been numerous offers, let's just say. Patriot Gold Group came to me, and the gold is actually something that I've been thinking about quite a bit because we're in very volatile times, very unpredictable times. So gold is the place that, that I think is a, one of the few kind of stable places to put money, uh, and Patriot Gold Group is a good company. We checked them out, and so I bought some gold with them, and you know the value, and this is kind of crazy, uh, since I bought it, I think about three weeks ago, of this gold has gone up by over $500, and this isn't a large amount of gold that I bought here. So let me show you what I got. So this is Rand Refinery, one ounce fine gold bullion, the American Eagle, and five silver eagles. So I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna pull out the gold eagle for you because it looks kind of awesome. Wow, it's got an amazing weight to it. So if you're inspired to buy some gold, I recommend you call Patriot Gold Group. You can call them at 888-857-0495, 888-857-0495. Mention American Thought Leaders. With that, let's head back to the interview. You have a number of uh, cases mm. where ivermectin corresponded with a kind of somewhat dramatic reduction of cancer in a, in a patient. So tell me about these. Well, okay, so the opening act in this story is that I began to do the scientific research, peer-reviewed, 
papers. Read them chronologically so you can understand what everyone is thinking as they make their discoveries and what they're thinking and the questions they ask and so on and so forth. And here was you know, all this research that ivermectin showed great potential as an anti-cancer agent. <clears throat> Having seen for myself and being very well persuaded by the work of Drs. Corey and Merrick and others, the data coming out of South Africa and India, that ivermectin was safe and effective in treating patients with COVID, I began to wonder to what extent might this be effective in treating patients with cancer? Well, I understood that the pharmaceutical industries were not going to invest in a 10 cent per pill pill. And if the pharmaceutical industries were not willing to do that, no one was gonna do it. As pharma funds everybody else that's doing research, right? Um, I was introduced to a patient with stage four prostate cancer, had received two vaccines, perfectly healthy, marathoner, no history of cancer in the family. Two months after his uh, second Pfizer shot, he works for the government, he's gonna lose his job and his pension if he wasn't vaccinated. Um, he was diagnosed all at once with stage four prostate cancer. He tells a very compelling story, melodramatic story about that 24 hour period of time in his life. Um, <clears throat> and he went through the traditional protocols, radiation, chemotherapy, radiation, chemotherapy, pharmacologic castration, all of it, over a period of nine months. And then his doctor said, you know, there's really nothing else we can do. And uh, his name is Paul Mann and he was like, can't you give me more radiation? No. Can't you give me more chemo? No. Aren't there any other drugs? No. Are there any clinical trials? There's nothing. Hospice. Send for the priest. So a friend of his knew me and she said, uh, would you give Paul a call? He just needs some moral support, something. So I said, sure. So I began calling him. We spoke about once a week for three weeks and finally, um, the poor guy was suffering, he had cancer and 11 bones in his body. His right leg was completely swollen, obstructed with tumor. He's miserable. And I said, Paul, I don't know if this is going to help you, but I know it's not gonna hurt you. I just can't imagine, based on my judgment and understanding of the scientific literature and all of the work that Drs. Corey and Merrick had done and others around the world, that ivermectin would hurt you. It might help. I can't say. So he said, you know, I'll give it a try. And uh, he drove to Tennessee where you could get it without a prescription. P.S. I discovered last night, having dinner with Paul and his wife, Terry, he drove from where he lives in Missouri to Tennessee and paid cash for his ivermectin. That's it. He didn't submit it to an insurance company. He didn't tell anybody back in Missouri, his oncologist, no. His ivermectin prescriptions are listed in his chart. How did that information get from the pharmacy in Tennessee to his chart in Missouri? We don't know. Somebody does, I'd like to know myself. Anyway, he starts taking ivermectin and he doesn't have any problems with it. And I talk to him every week and um, how are you feeling? Well, no change next week, uh, maybe a little bit better, I, I don't know. How's your leg? It's not quite as swollen. How, how's the pain, pain everywhere? Uh, maybe a little bit better, slowly, 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 not getting worse, not necessarily getting better, not getting worse. Fast forward, um, two month follow-up appointment at the clinic. They didn't expect to see him, <laughs> okay, he's like, Paul. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he's feeling a little bit better they do a PSA, which was off the charts to begin with. And if I'm not mistaken, at the time they randomized him to hospice, I think it was in the hundreds, maybe 700, 800. What does that mean exactly for the lay person? Over four would be abnormal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Prostate cells normally secrete a protein, prostate specific antigen, mm -hmm. it's one of the things that they do. 
cancer cells that originate in the prostate that are dividing rapidly and growing fast are spitting out PSA, mm -hmm. okay? It's not that they're contributing to the body economy in any way. It's just they just want to multiply and divide, and that's the end of the story. And so your PSA levels start to rise, which is a marker, a screening marker. Oh, your PSA was four, and now it's eight. Let's do a prostate ultrasound, whatever. So PSA can be a screen for the emergence of a tumor, but it can also be used, particularly at high levels, as evidence for cancer, response to cancer, recurrence of cancer. His was, all, I mean, it's supposed to be, you know, four, you know, yeah, it's hundreds. Okay, he goes back for his two-month appointment. It's 1.3. They said, you're in remission. Well, not, you know, complete remission. He still had the bone mats, but you're in like a biochemical remission. Well, that was good news. Slowly, 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 he begins to improve. Less pain, swelling is okay. A lot of other vaccine injuries, however, he's getting better. He's getting better, We're giving him uh, nutritional support and other supplements. He's having TIAs, little mini strokes. Hmm. But he didn't tell me about that because we were talking about the cancer. But over a period of time, I'm asking him questions. And he, I said, oh, you're having TIAs. His wife said, yeah, I'm having TIAs. I said, what do the cancer doctors tell you? Because that's who he's seeing. They say it's not related to my cancer. <laughs> it's like, so I get a call from his wife one evening. He's in the emergency room. He's had this TIA, whatever it is, catastrophic. And um, I said, Paul, what are they doing for you? And he said, well, they did a CAT scan of my head. And they said, they don't see anything specific. It's a TIA and it's not related to my cancer. They send him home. I said, did they do anything? No. I said, well, okay, call me crazy. I'm a cancer surgeon, but I think you need to see a cardiologist. I think there are things they can do, okay? And of course, I look it up really quickly, and, and of course, there are things. So get him to the cardiologist, get him on blood thinners, no more problems with TIAs, mm -hmm. okay? That's an indictment of the healthcare system. So he's getting better, but nine months later, um, he's out dancing for four hours, three nights a week. He gets a head to toe uh, rescanning. And uh, three of the bone mets are gone. There are no growth of the mets that are there, no new lesions. There's only one hot spot, and that's where he received radiation therapy, and the radiation, uh, the radiologist really could not distinguish whether that was a tumor hot spot or radiation change. Mm. Um, he is doing very well. Now, the vaccine injury is uh, a problem. But the cancer is no longer a problem, except for the fact that it's still there, and we want to get rid of it completely. Um, and, he, and he said, he called me from a hockey game, and he said, uh, if I didn't know I have cancer, I would not know I have cancer. That was patient number one. I was like, that's interesting. A second patient crossed my path, a guy in his 70s who had been losing weight for a year and a half, 40 pounds not vaccinated, 40 pound weight loss, smoker, drinker, all he does is fish. And um, he could no longer swallow and he could hardly talk. <laughs> and so I got on the phone with him and uh, I said, uh, Eddie, you know, tell me a little bit about your history and so forth. He knew someone with prostate cancer who had taken ivermectin and cured himself from prostate cancer with that. So Eddie began taking ivermectin I have no idea what the dosing was. He was just taking it. And uh, I gave him some advice about diet and you know, try and get the weight back on and so on and so forth. Within a couple of weeks, he sounded stronger, mm -hmm. sounded stronger. He could swallow. He had gained six pounds. His, his voice was better. Followed him for the next couple of weeks, maybe another month or so, and I said, Eddie, we need to get a scan. He doesn't have insurance, he doesn't like doctors, whatever. He had been diagnosed in that interval with two esophageal tumors, unresectable, surgeons wouldn't go near it. The uh, doctor said, well, we'll give you chemo and radiation, and he said, no, you're not. <laughs> so he takes his ivermectin, maybe about six weeks later, I said, Eddie, you need to get a, a scan. I had to argue with Eddie to get a scan, we got the scan, no tumors, gone, gone. 
The problem was that he had sold his fishing boat. That was the biggest problem. He was getting better, his tumor was gone. Now he needed to go out and buy another fishing boat. That was the second patient. I was like, well, now that's interesting. Third patient was a woman who was referred to me. Her husband called me, he said, could you talk to my wife? I think she's got a problem. She could feel a lump in her lower pelvis. And uh, she'd had that for a while. I said, do you have any vaginal bleeding? Yes, a little bit, but not much. She was in her 60s. And I said, um, I think the best thing to do would be to go to the doctor and get a CAT scan. She didn't like doctors, she doesn't have insurance, she's not getting a CAT scan. I was able to convince her to get at least an ultrasound. She gets an ultrasound, she has a six centimeter tumor in her pelvis. It's close to the colon, it's close to the ovary, it might be near the uterus, who knows? It's just wedged down there. And I said, you know, it would be very helpful if you would at least be willing to do a needle biopsy because if it's cancer, it's gonna make a difference in terms of what your choices are. Nope, she's not gonna do that. So I called her periodically over the next couple of months and I'm fine, no problem, whatever. And I said, well, call me if you need me, you know. So this was, I think, like in April, May. Um, and I got a call December 23rd from her husband, 9.30 at night. Her belly is distended. She can't eat. Uh, she's not passing gas. She's not passing stool. Her, her abdomen hurts. And I said, press down on her belly. Does that hurt? Yeah, it pre it, when he presses, yeah, it hurts. I said, now press and lift up really quickly. F like flick the belly. Does that hurt? Yeah, that's worse. I said, get her to the emergency room. We don't have insurance. We don't like doctors. We're in West Virginia. We hate the, <laughs> we, we hate the hospitals. I said, look, she's going to blow out her bowel. And then you're going to take her to the emergency room. And she's going to die. I suggest you go now. Okay, take her to the emergency room. They do a CAT scan, 18 centimeter tumor. Who knows <laughs> what it's wrapped around, 18 centimeter tumor. They give her intravenous uh, and I said, let me talk to the ER doc. And I said, is she stable enough? Can you rehydrate her? Is she stable enough to go to Charlottesville? Because I have family, I know people in Charlottesville, UVA is a great hospital. Let's see if we can get her to Charlottesville. Yes. So the ER doctor, I can imagine, was very happy to get her on the way to UVA. And they admit her, you know, Christmas Eve. And um, they hydrate her and they give her nutrition. And the surgical oncology uh, head of, of, of the surgical oncology team comes in to see her. Brilliant surgeon, brilliant surgeon, a Persian. And he said, I'm not sure that I can resect this, but let's tune you up and let's see what we can do. If I can, I will. So she gets all tuned up, ready to go. Um, the hospital would not give her unvaccinated blood. So there was a big Shakespearean melodrama the night before surgery, but she said, I I've got to have the surgery. So, okay, she did not require blood transfusion, thank God. So the surgical oncologist, this brilliant SEAL Team 6 surgeon goes in with a vascular team, a, a, a GYN team, their urologic team, because it's wrapped around the ureter and who knows what's going on with the uterus and the surgical team, so forth. They all go in and seven and a half hours later, they close, they have negative margins. They got the whole thing to negative margins. She had Mets in her liver, three Mets in the liver, and then postoperatively during her recovery, um, the metastatic lesions in the liver multiplied, which is not uncommon. She went home maybe five or six days later, uneventful post-operative course. Again, you know, A plus to the surgical team at UVA. She gets in the car, she goes back to West Virginia, and of course, the medical oncology people at UVA insist she have chemo. They are breathing down, they're making appointments for her. <laughs> it's not a, not a question, you know. We think you should have this pro, you know. Here's your appointment, here's your appointment. And she goes, yeah, I'm going back to West Virginia. She starts taking ivermectin. And I think she was probably taking a little bit higher dose, I can't really say. Um, I don't think it was sky high. But anyway, ivermectin, as I said to you, is safer than a sugar pill, 
you'd have to take a lot to make yourself sick. Well, let, let, let's stop for a moment. <laughs> yeah. Safer than, t tell me that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. this might be a bit of an exaggeration, but not by much. Um, ivermectin is so non-toxic that if you gave someone, you know, ivermectin every day, if you did a randomized trial, these people are getting ivermectin every day and these people are getting sugar pills every day, my prediction, test it, see what happens, would be that the people who are getting the sugar pills would end up having more harm, at least, in, you know, spikes in their insulin level than the people taking ivermectin. So that's why I say, kind of flippantly, mm -hmm. you know, it's safer than a sugar pill. Anyway, she starts taking ivermectin, and uh, I said, uh, we need to do a scan, you know. Uh, everybody gets sick of hearing me say we need to do a scan. Um, she didn't want that. How about an ultrasound? Because you can image the uh, liver pretty well with an ultrasound, and he, she had had an ultrasound, so we could compare. Liver's clean, nothing in the liver. She's fine. She's driving around with the husband, she's going down to the border, she's pushing back against the aliens, whatever. She's just, she's doing very, very well. So that was the third patient. And I thought, I cannot just wait for patient four through N, as I describe it, to see if ivermectin really is effective. Something has to be done. I feel compelled to do something. What is that going to be? What am I going to do? And I had to think hard because I didn't have the money to fund a study which would, on average, cost $6 million for a phase one study of a repurposed medication. What could I do? What could I do? And then after a good hard think, I thought, well, an observational study like the Framingham study where you identify a population, in the Framingham study, it was the people who lived in Framingham, but in this observational study, it would be patients with cancer who themselves decided, either in addition or instead of or whatever, they decided they were going to use ivermectin and other repurposed medications as part of their cancer care. And I, as principal investigator, being just the neutral woman with a chart collecting data, this observational data prospectively, I would be recording the data and that would allow me to see over a period of time whether there was a survival advantage in patients with cancer who were taking ivermectin and other repurposed medications compared to historical controls. And we have decades of historical controls. As an example, what is the likelihood that someone with a stage four prostate cancer sent to hospice would have, over a period of nine months, a remission and a clinical improvement as Paul experienced. Well, as I say, it's not zero probability, but it approaches zero. What is the likelihood that a patient with stage four cancer, a patient with stage three unresectable esophageal cancer, a patient with an 18 centimeter Kuchenberg tumor in her pelvis would all have such remarkable results that you might attribute to ivermectin, seeming to be the common denominator. One, two, three, what is the likelihood of that happening? Like winning the lottery, the first three tickets you buy? That approaches zero, that probability approaches zero. Nonetheless, that's not how we do science. We don't do science by saying, you know, it's really odd that these three people had this experience. You create the hypothesis, you create the question, you design a study in such a way that you can answer the question and validate it and make sure that the data that you collect are neutral, verifiable, you can audit the data, someone else who's not involved in the study is responsible, the biostatistician for evaluating the data. Now you have the data, you've accumulated that over a period of time, you turn that over for peer review, you go through all of that, and then you publish. So I began, had a wonderful opportunity to speak to Dr. Merrick about this. He was very interested. And as God would have it, um, he thought there was great wisdom in having a multi-center observational study, as I've described where you have multiple co-principal investigators with the clipboard, with the data 
element list that we have compiled with an independent biostatistician all moving forward to collect the data with Dr. Merrick, who you can't find someone with better credentials. Okay, I believe that he's, God teed him up to do this. <laughs> he probably didn't expect he was gonna be doing this, but I think that God teed him up to do this. And so he'll be the, the principal investigator on this large multi-center observational study. We'll collect the data and if we see a signal, that is, if we observe and the biostatistician validates and peers concur that the patients who are taking these repurposed medications like ivermectin, especially now that we know how ivermectin works when it's working in the dirt, <laughs> um, then we will be able to launch additional questions and additional studies and continue to move this ball downfield. And so I just want to clarify one thing. You said, do I understand correctly that you tried ivermectin three times only for cancer and these were the three results well i didn't try it okay so we had to be clear yeah i didn't try it the pa i, I the discussed with tried the patient it. i said you yeah. know think about this yeah here are the studies refer the patients talk to them at, they and then they decide ivermectin is approved by the fda and thank you the fifth district right and uh the incompetent attorney for the Department of Justice defending the FDA, who wasn't able to argue that physicians and providers cannot prescribe ivermectin or other FDA-approved medications based on their judgment. Patients can get it across the counter in Tennessee. Patients chose to do this. I was there calling, finding out how you're doing, and learning your cancer's gone. <laughs> It's not there. <laughs> the, the three cases you're aware of where this was done. Yeah. That, you know, people were, you know, calling you results. about. Yeah. All of them cleared up. That is an unexpected result that would warrant a study of the nature. Yeah. That you're describing. I think so. Yeah. I think so. So, yeah. no, and so how many, are, are, is there a patient number right now across all these different centers? Um, oh, it's just officially been launched. Okay. Um, it, I am asked a lot in you know, these past couple of days, you know, what are your data? I'm like, principal investigators do not discuss the data until they have the data. Mm -hmm. And then they don't discuss the data until it's been validated by a bi biostatistician and peer reviewed. No principal investigator would jump in early on and say, oh, we have 100 patients and we're, no, that's not how studies are done. Now, there is an imperative to do this as quickly as possible, but not recklessly. Fortunately, patients that we're seeing today, particularly those with advanced cancer, don't have long to live. So we don't have to do a 20-year study as you should if you were evaluating a vaccine, right, or a new drug. We don't have to wait five years to see the separation in curves. If there is a separation based on these repurposed medications, we're not gonna to have to wait five years to see that. We'll conduct a study for at least five years. I would imagine it's gonna be open-ended. Why not do what Framingham did? Framingham didn't shut the study down. Framingham has been going at it for decades. Right. Why not keep the studies open and see how far downfield you can get with that? Well, and you'll, and you'll quickly see you know, what, how many out of the people that are around are making it basically yeah. because of that. That's um, incredible. I wish you luck with this. Well, you know, science is the uncertain pursuit of the unknown. And I'm not sure it's, uh, it's luck so much as it is paying attention, right? You pay attention, you discern, you use your judgment. You use your judgment. There were, a medical student asked the question uh, in the forum yesterday uh, uh, based on uh, William Osler's statement to the medical students at Johns Hopkins, half of what we teach you is wrong, we don't know which half it is. And the medical student said, well, how am I supposed to figure this out? You use your judgment. That's what you really learn as a professional. Use your judgment. Pay attention, look at the data, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. Use your judgment act, do something. I mean, unless you're just gonna be an ivory tower kind of person, use your judgment and then act. As the uh, Africans say, 
when you pray, move your feet. Act, okay? Three, prepare for trouble, no matter what it is. Prepare for difficulties. FLCCC can tell you firsthand the difficulties. Merrill Nash, I mean, people, we ran into trouble, right? And we're running into trouble now. Prepare for difficulties. Expect it. Defend yourself. Identify what the vulnerabilities are. Expect them. Preempt them to the extent that you can. You can't preempt everything. Don't be surprised when it happens. Don't give up. Okay? Don't give up. Paul Mann has tattooed on the inner wrist. Don't give up. He wanted to remind himself. <laughs> I'm dying of cancer. Don't give up. Okay? <laughs> Don't give up. And finally, do your best. Do your best. Those five principles. Yeah, luck? Sure, fine. We'll take luck. Just do those things um, and you'll be lucky enough. Let's put it that way. Well, and, you know, in not too long, we'll have some you know, preliminary results from this, from these studies. I'll be very interested in knowing what they show. Me too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Me too. You know, and it's not, on the other hand, you know, I, at the beginning I was saying, you know, there's this ivermectin obsession here with this group. I'm kind of joking. I'm kind of being glib, of course. Yeah. But, you know, Dr. Paul Merrick has indeed, you know, looked into, you know, hundreds of different papers of methods of mm. both prevention and treatment of cancer, of things that we just simply weren't aware of, or like we're not, not in our frame of reference, not in his frame of reference in most cases. Right. Yeah. Never mind mine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and there's a lot of them. I mean, vit there's this astonishing uh, vit study on vitamin D that 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 we talked about at our interview. He said it was yeah. the one of the most, most significant findings he had he had found. I mean, who knew, right? Yeah. That vitamin D can help with a few other things, and, and you know, very rigorous yeah. evidence for that, right? And, but there's so many, there's actually so many things that don't involve or could work in addition to things like, you know, radiation or a chemo and, and so forth. So why, why not ivermectin, you know, right? I guess that, that's also the, the question. Yeah, well, let's see ivermectin. Let's see mebendazole, metformin, sildenafil, vitamin D3 at higher doses, curcumin, all, there's a whole list. Are you, are you, are you working on those as well? I allow the patients to make their decisions. My job, as I see it, is to provide, to answer all questions that occur to them. And they're pretty well informed, which is a blessing. Um, and to give them the information that I have that I think they would find useful. There are issues, I believe, potential issues, uh, with the use of ivermectin in patients with a brain tumor. It's a bit uh, of a challenge, and we've got to discuss that with the patient. So they might say, well, I don't know if I'm interested in using it. I've got a brain tumor. And from what you're telling me, that ivermectin might not be the best choice. There is something else that would be perhaps a better choice, mebendazole. So the patients are making the choice. My job is to give them the information that they need to help them make that choice. But they decide. They decide. So that them. reminds me of something that sometimes gets lost recently. It's something called informed consent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what informed consent is. I'll tell you what I know. Um, and <laughs> I, I encourage patients to do this. Um, I, desperately ill wonderful man, desperately ill, with a brain tumor. And um, there was nothing else I could do. Radiation, chemo, there's nothing else I could do. Um, and he was, you know, losing the fight by the day. And, uh, but there was a protocol. His medical oncologist said, you have to do this. You have to do this. And I said, ask the medical oncologist why you have to do this. Ask the medical oncologist, does he have any information about the potential for this to be beneficial. Is there anything in the literature anywhere? And if there is any information, could he share that information? Oh, we all, 40 percent of the patients dropped out of the trial, and 2 percent of the patients had a catastrophic side effect, and nobody lived longer. But you have to do this trial. You have to sign. And so the patient goes, and this is the conversation. And uh, the patient's like, you can't tell me if there's any benefit of the trial. 
uh, you're not free to tell me what any of the preliminary complications might be. I'm signing this consent. And you've got two pages of complications here, but you're not discussing that with me. But you're telling me that I have to do this? This is my only choice? And the patient said, no, thank you. So, yeah. Thorough informed consent. Well, and, you know, when it comes to all of these existing standard therapies, there is, all of them have, you know, they don't work 100%. You have to, there's a, there's a risk-benefit, right, in any one of these scenarios that, mm -hmm. that and this is, you know, this is one of the things I hadn't really thought about that much until COVID, right? Mm -hmm. And understanding that that's always the calculation you have to make with any disease, any treatment for that disease and the side effects and, and so forth. You have, there's kind of, that's, that's why every doctor needs to look at each patient individually yeah. and, and ask the question, how, how valuable is this for you and what are the possible costs then you'll and in the end you can you right. can choose if this is right 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 and some patients may say you know enroll me in the study if it kills me maybe i add some beneficial right. information fine there'll be some patients who'll say i've had enough <laughs> okay i'm done <laughs> okay i'm dying if you can't tell me that i'll tell you i'm dying i'm gonna go home make me comfortable at home please Patient stories. And I can just, you know, Im imagine there's some cases where people are, you know, where the doctor will say, well, frankly, this seems to be the only reasonable, it has its risks, but it's the only thing I see help. Yeah. Right. And that, that's reasonable too, right? Yeah, sure. Some, yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. You were also talking about um, these uh, breast cancer viruses, <laughs> right? And so, so what do we know about that right now? What's, this, what's the state of knowledge? We know that a breast cancer virus exists in mice. No one has any question about that. The animal models that are used to study drugs and interventions uh, that might translate into use in women with breast cancer are all based on these mice that get breast cancer, and they get breast cancer because of the breast cancer virus, which was discovered by John Bittner in 1936. That virus has been found in other animals. That virus has been found in rats, cats, dogs, monkeys, and that virus has been found in humans. Uh, Dr. James Holland, who since passed away, um, a highly respected, venerated researcher, professor of medical oncology and virology at Mount Sinai, Beatrice Pogo, a professor of virology at Mount Sinai, found this virus in human breast cancer. Others have found it. There's decades of research, I mean a hundred years of research um, on this breast cancer virus. In the uh, run-up to the uh, passage of the National Cancer Act, there were hearings in the Senate. And at that hearing, uh, Dr. Holland talked about the breast cancer virus. That was 50 years ago. There were other researchers talking about tumor viruses. The, one of the largest study sections at the NCI, so the NCI funds research based on study sections. This is a section we're going to study this. So one of the largest study sections at the NCI for maybe 10, 20 years prior to the drafting of the National Cancer Act was tumor viruses, leukemia, lymphoma, SV40, the breast cancer virus. When the National Cancer Act was passed and it was declared, hmm. as if written in stone, that we would cure cancer in five years, this was a pipe dream, the pipe dream of a woman who had a degree in heart, art history, who persuaded Nixon, who needed a way out from a deteriorating public polling. He was having a bad rap in Vietnam. The war on cancer, how about that? <laughs> we'll replace the war in Vietnam with a war on cancer. Everybody ought to love that. And we're going to cure cancer in five years. Great. We don't need to know what causes it. So all of the research on tumor viruses was completely deep sixed. That's the end of the story on the breast cancer virus. I was completely unaware of it. I had done my fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I had 
never heard of the breast cancer virus. So when I heard of the existence of one, because Holland had uh, published a paper and presented it at the San Antonio breast uh, meeting uh, at 2006, December 2006, I was like, what? <laughs> it's a breast cancer virus? The story as I began to understand it was so intriguing. So I wrote a book about it and then tried to advance, to reawaken Susan G. Komen Foundation, Susan Love Foundation, American Cancer, and nobody's interested in the breast cancer virus. Why? Because we're treating it. We have mammogram screening and we're finding it early and we have Arimidex and we have Receptin. I'm like, you know, we discovered that HPV causes cervical cancer. You make a vaccine, a proper vaccine against that. You need to make a proper vaccine against that, one that's safe. If you take the virus out of the equation, you don't get cervical cancer. John Bittner showed that with the breast cancer virus. So the research on the breast cancer virus has inched forward against enormous opposition in the past 20 years. But perhaps one of the great blessings of this global catastrophe will be a better understanding of ivermectin and repurposed medications and how and why they work. And given the fact that I've been asked to share my thoughts about this from time to time, I get a chance to talk about the breast cancer virus and see if we can't reawaken some interest in this because if it's true that a virus causes breast cancer in women, we need to know about that and we need to do something about that. And another monoclonal antibody is not what I'm talking about. I mean, absolutely fascinating. And, and you know, a book, a book, another book to, to for my for my reading. Mm -hmm. So how many other molecules are have been identified that are these, you know, immune systems in a molecule, as you would describe it? Well, I think all of the antibiotics are nature's bioweapons. Mm -hmm. right? Dare we even use that term? Which is why something like doxycycline is part of a protocol. Uh, Right? Um, Atorvastin, you know, a, a statin. Um, I think that Dr. Merrick has identified 10, 13 uh, various natural compounds. Green tea extract, right? Tea, green tea, leaves in nature. Nature paths will tell you all about this. How many are there? I have no idea. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Merrick has identified uh, a list. My view is that there's justification for the items on his list. And if we begin to take this seriously and move forward seriously, we can begin to look at other naturally, more naturally occurring. I mean, is this almost like a kind of new sub-branch of medicine or something that we're launching here? No, I think it's a renovation of an old branch of medicine called okay. cancer oncology. Okay. Mm. Every now and again you have to renovate, right? Have you ever renovated a kitchen? You can take the house down to the foundation. Um, I don't think we need to burn the house down. I think there's so many smart people, so many good people. Um, I mean, really brilliant, wonderful people that have contributed to this vast body of knowledge. I think we have to renovate. I think we've got a leaky roof, and the, the windows aren't quite right, and the floor is slowly <laughs> a big job ahead of us. Hmm. Um, I think we can renovate, and I think that a renovation of cancer, I'll probably take a lot of heat, but prepare for trouble, right? Item number three on the list, prepare for trouble. I think that it's possible that the principles of medical oncology based on chemotherapy, cytotoxic chemotherapy, will give way to a new approach where it's not targeted because targeted therapy is not targeted to the tumor. Herceptin targets cancer cells that express HER2 new, but also targets the heart, <laughs> okay? Targets other, other organs. Truly um, targeting the cancer and the metabolic pathways of cancer leaving the rest of you alone, boosting the immune system. That's the renovation. And as I, I said earlier, <laughs> this is something of an exaggeration, but maybe this will be what happens. Uh, you replace um, things like the iron lung for polio, mm -hmm. right? 
um, and you replace face masks. You replace cytotoxic chemotherapy with other interventions that are not toxic, but that get the job done. Mm. Well, Dr. Kathleen Reddy, it's such a pleasure to have had you on. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining Dr. Kathleen Reddy and me on this episode of American Thought Leaders. I'm your host, Yanya Kellick. Mm -hmm.